Cool. Okay, so welcome everybody to uh, our next, I think it's 66th, uh, Reading Online Sport Economics Seminar. Uh, we have uh, this week Alex Gillett. Gillett? How do I say your name, Alex? I, I say Gillett, but people in York tend to pronounce a soft G, so I get called Alex Gillett quite a lot as well. Anything will do, so long as it's polite. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that was polite enough. Uh, Alex Gillett and uh, Kevin Tennant are going to be uh, presenting. Before they start, a uh, couple of administrative notices. The first one is that we are quite close to having a, an autumn schedule. Autumn is, uh, is fast upon us. We're not going to meet next week. Uh, and the following week will be in September. Uh, unfortunately, the night's drawing in, um, but we will have uh, lots, uh, lots more uh, online seminars uh, through to Christmas, so that's quite nice and exciting. And uh, I already shared in the uh, invite for today's um, in, uh, some of that schedule, uh, and so I do look out for those talks uh, when they start to appear. Uh, and the exciting news, which has already been mentioned, if you've been if you've been on the call for a few moments, is that um, previous Roses presenter, twice previous Roses presenter, Alex Farnell, uh, this week has passed his PhD fiver. Uh, and so we can uh, give our congratulations to Alex for a fantastic achievement. Yep, uh, there's a, both you can, if you're unmuted, you can uh, do a genuine old fashioned round of applause or you can uh, use the team's uh, applause icon. <laughs> in this day and age, um, but well done Alex for a fantastic achievement, thoroughly deserved. Um, and um, so, uh, after all that, well, we will uh, now uh, uh, invite Alex uh, and Kevin to take away their talk on the evolution of UK leisure centres in the mid <coughs> 20th century. If you have questions while they're presenting, uh, do raise your hand uh, and uh, they will hopefully be able to uh, take questions for clarifications while the talk's ongoing and then we can have, we have plenty of time left for Q&A uh, once they've finished their talk. So after uh, all yours, Alex and Kevin. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. Just uh, we do the share for the yeah, it's just see like just the entire. Oh, I may have read. Hang on. <laughs> Two seconds. That's okay. That's I'll awesome. just begin in, yeah, just to, just it while you do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's great. Just before this began, we're just saying um, it's really great to to be presenting in the series. Um, you know just to such a such a great audience really because it's broad and somewhat dispersed from what i can tell as well so we, we get lots of kind of angles we've already had some good engagement with the idea based on the description that was circulated we've had a couple of people emailing already with um you know different perspectives and things which has been quite nice now not that we're looking or easily taken from what we're doing because we already sort of have an output for at least the first thing of this we have a, a book series with Emerald and uh, someone who's doing an edited volume asked us for a chapter and this is what we wanted to do for that. So we've got some vision for this, but we're also aware that, you know, we're quite new to the exact topic, but stuff has been done elsewhere. So we're just, one of the things we're, we're hoping to get really is, you know, some ideas of what that is, what's being looked at, thoughts that come out about what, what could be interesting here to make sure at least when we're doing our background and literature review, if not ideas for more research, or if not the the narrative itself, um, that we we include that stuff. And we don't just write something that's, this is exciting, we've just discovered it, you know, because we know that we're not the first people to, to be aware of this. But we're doing, we're trying to be as thorough as we can. Okay, so yeah, the evolution of public services, UK leisure centres in the late 20th century. Where this began, I guess, is because a few years ago now, maybe like eight, nine years ago, we were doing some research on English football clubs in the 1980s. And we were looking at the Middlesbrough Football Club as, as a case, and they had some um, carry on around a, a sports hall they were building adjacent to the stadium. And that was seen as being somewhat influential in the uh, financial turbulence that they were experiencing. It affected the cash flow, basically. And, uh, in 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 a, a big way, and and meant that they had a lot of of debt as well and and liabilities and things, so that was quite interesting. But what we learned was that they were um, what hadn't been written about more widely in histories of the the club was that they were reaching out to other teams who'd already built sports centres, leisure facilities, and things as part of their uh, stadium or training ground that were op open to the public and things. 
And um, yeah, we, we, we also traced back to that. We got research into the 1960s and the World Cup and the influence of that. And we did some stuff on the FIFA World Cup. But then coming back to the football club stuff and the sports centre stuff, we discovered about, you know, as we're researching the World Cup about the sports policies and things that were coming through post-World War II, through the 60s and 70s and 80s, um, there, was, there was a whole lot of stuff going on, basically. So this gave us the, the idea um, for, for studying this. So we've done a chapter where we outlined sport as being a really good lens. If you want people want to research management history, sport is a good way of doing that because it ties in with business, with, with government, with policy and all kinds of things. And it, it, gives, it gives a good insight. Um, and, and there's a lot more going on. And I think people sometimes, you know, if you're in a business school, you sometimes feel, oh, yeah, we looked at sport then. And people might say, oh, yeah, as if it's a frivolous thing. But it's actually big business, big part of public life is a non-business angle to it as well, which is still financial or, or influenced by some of the, the, the laws and things which are going on. So we find it really interesting and we try and champion that. But I know we're preaching to the, the converted here. Um, the paper focuses on public services in England, um, specifically leisure centre provision uh, and public services, because a lot of these originally were heavily financed or, or subsidised for their ongoing cost by local authorities, essentially. That changed a bit and it became more of a private concern a bit later on. We chart the evolution um, of UK sport and leisure provision. Um, through the lens of sort of business and public policy. Um, and we, we show how um, some of this was done directly, but local authorities also sought or were encouraged to partner up with um, sports clubs as well. So I think something that happened was, you know, they were putting a lot of money into this and coming up with ideas, and some of it was led by architects and some by local government ideas or public sector more generally ideas of what, what could be done but at some point it was decided well money should be used more efficiently we don't want doubling up of services and actually there are people who are who know how to run sports complexes and do sports management already and they're working professionally in sport it doesn't all have to be done you know as a separate thing so I think clubs were encouraged to partner up with um, local authority provision and so on to, to provide some of this so, and, and this ties in, you know, we said, we've we said for a long time, many of the football clubs had a quasi public character. Uh, collaborations went on in all sorts of ways. And there was local government were encouraged um, formally to protect their clubs because of community value as well at the local government level. I'm not sure if it was seen quite that way at, at national government in, in England, certainly, but at local government was a, was a different matter actually. Um, the historical narrative sees it generally as an architecturally led phenomenon, you know, so architects would do market research and build leisure pools and things based on what they perceived as being the public needs or what was happening in America. But we're showing that sports clubs are involved with this as well. Um, yeah, and that there was a professional angle, the, the rise of um, the, the leisure centre manager as a, a kind of profession as well we see as quite important. Okay, next slide, please. So our methods, um, exploratory and inductive research. There's no huge equation in the research we're doing here, um, but um, we are interested in all types of methods and, and research in, in terms of what informs what we're doing. Um, so we're keen to hear from people who are doing more um, mathematically based studies of, of this kind of thing. But anyway, what we're doing is consistent with what uh, Wanda McCall in a public management review published a paper for them 2011, talks about more longitudinal research needed in public sector research. Um, temporality and geography, basically, I, you know, it sounds obvious, obviously important, but sometimes surprised how much they're not uh, always covered in some papers looking at the public management issues. So we draw upon a deep and broad seam of archival sources, uh, and this is where I think some originality comes for us. We've looked at, you know, football club and, and sports hall archive stuff. We've seen things in uh, the National Archives, We've researched at FIFA, the Football Association in England, as well as internet resources, market industry reports, and secondary literature on policy, leisure and tourism, and business and management history as well. 
so it's not just another architecture study or a, or, or a, you know economic geography study it's we, i don't know his management history more broadly so what we found headline terms after some initial post-war interest in developing sports centers sport became a formal policy area in um, the united kingdom from the 1960s onwards um, i'm sure you know recreation leisure sport i've read things which say you know victorian times there's provision of this and certainly uh, local uh, philanthropists entrepreneurs um, mayors and so on champion things based on their personal views there's also you know religious movements uh, temperance and so on that's gone on before that around public health and recreation and get people out of pubs and doing other things but in terms of um, what went on post -war World War II, they were specifically getting keen on these sports centres, and from the 60s onwards, the idea of the, the you know uh, government or public sector ran leisure centre. Um, rapid expansion of this happened through the 60s and 70s, and this is where we start to see professional football clubs involvement. And we've seen archival things to show that Aston Villa and Manchester City. We're doing this. I, I believe last time I was at the Aston Villa Stadium, the, the Villa Leisure Centre is still there. And I believe in the 1990s, actually, when I was in, very interested in music and things, Nirvana played at the, uh, or were due, scheduled to play at the Aston Villa one. And I don't think it went ahead. I think he might have died just before that. I'm not sure. But it, anyway, that was that was a big, you know, fairly well known one. But Middlesbrough tried to, to copy the model, but the timing wasn't great. Um, I think we cover that in a, in, a, in a slide further on, but it is important to the overall narrative. So the funding got cut basically at the end of the 70s and they had to share a grant that watered it down. Other money needed to be put in and it caused a whole load of, of problems for, for their particular case. But it, it showed a trend going on. There was going to be less public money for these things and more money from other sources used to, to finance them. Uh, and that trend carried on. And now Bannertines, David Lloyds, the private gyms, seem to have taken up a lot of this space actually. But uh, we can see a trend from the, the, the local municipal sports and leisure facility to the sports club, uh, local government operated thing to sort of leisure centers, uh, increasingly maybe trying to bring in a bit more money as well, putting prices up and things through to now uh, more of a boom in private gyms and personal trainers and <laughs> pelotons and God knows what else. Uh, in the uh, in the, the modern day. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So, what kind of starts to happen then? Really, and what this is about to some extent is a kind of creation of a sort of institutional context, really, for the government to get involved in sport as a field and the kind of provision of sports facilities, if you like. And and this is an expectation that it it, it never quite goes away. But the, the interesting starting point here is that, so unlike many local authority services in the UK, um, so public health in general, but also, you know, things like um, collecting the bins, for example, refuse collection areas like this, local authorities never had a statutory duty to provide leisure services as such. So it's something that they grew organically in a sense. It was a field that they moved into uh, because they were able to, and this leads to all sorts of hybrid solutions there, and it, it always does kind of fuse the public and private to an extent. Um, but where this kind of comes from, really, part of it comes from sort of central government. Um, so you, what you get, so one thing that we saw when we looked actually at the World Cup in 1966 was that one thing that Dennis Howell, who was the first sports minister, did essentially was to get the government to fund the World Cup. And that was a story that we told. The other thing that happened at the same time was that he established a sports council, essentially he established the sports council as a body which was able to, it has a parcel of government. The idea is it had a parcel of government funding and community bodies or local authorities, uh, sports clubs as well, like football clubs could come forward and bid for projects. Um, and, and this is not with reference to any particular sport or even um, as far as we can tell kind of gender or things like that or towards any particular social group but it's just about the idea of disseminating kind of sport uh, 
participation. And the reasoning behind this really is that, so from the late 50s onwards, the kind of moral panic really about the rise of youth culture. So what you get in the 50s, of course, and I became very aware of this topic when I studied. So I did a big project on music. I worked on a big project on the music industry a few years ago. And what you get is a kind of rise of kind of youth culture, the creation of the teenager in the late 50s, particularly, where there's this suddenly there's this kind of a whole new category of people between children and adults that there's a kind of new awareness of. And at the same time, you have things like national service, which is a hangover from the Second World War, but still national service ending and 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 and, and at the same time, kind of a, a gradual fall off in manufacturing employment and things like this as well. So what a lot of the questions come about around, well, what do we do with kind of young people, essentially? So you've got people that would have gone into employment at 13, 14 before that are now not in employment until a bit later. This gives them more time to misbehave. OK, so there are all of these kinds of issues around it. So the Albemarle Report from 1960 creates a need for the government to start intervening in what's called youth work generally. And this is one kind of field of endeavour. Um, and, and, and part of this is a sense of, OK, there should be physical training, there should be opportunities for sport um, or participation, there should be structure and things like this. So what you then start to get really is a, a sort of grouping of towns that are either kind of new towns or the kind of second industrial revolution growth centres really. So places like Harlow in Essex, which is a new town, one of the satellite towns established around London, or places like Billingham and Farnaby, Stockton and so on in the northeast. Just realised we've got Billingham twice in that, so important it was. But essentially places like Billingham, they were company towns. OK, so they're essentially private new towns. Um, so Billingham was basically a place that um, ICI took a heavy role in establishing. So ICI uh, had a factory there that manufactured dye stuffs from after the First World War. And this, this became a leading kind of chemical centre, basically in the UK and it was in the 1960s, it was kind of that, at the very height of its kind of industrial strength, if you like. Um, but also places like Newcastle follow this and off and laid uh, Port Talbot in Wales, which again was in the satellite of one of the kind of new concentrated steel mills, which was built by the government as well. So one of the big kind of government policies of the 50s and 60s really is to concentrate industry together. So there's an idea, broadly speaking, that British industry is failing falling behind and this has been a this has been a big kind of anxiety of the British probably since about 1900 if I'm honest but what they start to do is merge firms together try to build bigger and bigger plants so Redcar near Middlesbrough, Scunfort and Port Talbot would be cases of this the chemical industry doing similar things but what this creates is these local authorities that have really big um, rateable incomes from these big factories and what they do then is they start to they start to basically reuse these rateable incomes to produce these new multi-sport centres. So the idea is you know, bring together all sorts of sport. You can get some external funding maybe from the sports council as well um, and things like this, but you can have multi-sport centres, you can have a sport hall. If you have a sport hall, then you can use it you know, for fireside football, but you can also use it for netball, you can use it for hockey, you can use it for gymnastics, you can use it for concerts as well, all sorts of things, and you can have other kinds of arenas and facilities. Sometimes a swimming pool is added, sometimes not. So it doesn't always mean that there's a swimming pool. So in some cases there is, some cases there isn't. Um, but swimming pools are a little bit more specialist. So some of the historical literature prioritizes swimming pools and says, well, look, they're building them with wave machines and so on. And that's quite important, but it, it seems to be more of a subcategory when you look at it in the right. I think, I think it's worth saying at this point as well, if you read um, academic sources about leisure centres sometimes they do differentiate some use the phrase yeah, leisure yeah. centre to mean something that has specifically it's a sports facility but based around a leisure pool like yeah. with there's not a swimming pool it's just shallow and it's for playing yeah. <laughs> whereas there's a more broader term and i think this reflects reality because certainly well just to be reflexive a second i mean kevin are both from sort of the northeast where i you know born late 70s and i grew up with 
the leisure centre, you just there were just a fact they were there. The, the leisure centres. We yeah, were yeah. fortunate to grow up with these affordable places to have kids' birthday, our birthday parties, or learn to swim, and things. And they had real swimming pools in them, and they were called a leisure centre. You know, so I don't. Some of the academic stuff gets very hung up on. This is our definition, but the reality is not always what the academic theory is saying. It's like now the reality, practical reality was they were called leisure centres. One thing I'm not sure, though, is if they were originally called a sports and rec centre and then were subsequently labelled a leisure centre to tap into funding or something. <laughs> I don't know. But what? anyway, they, they've been we, we grew up knowing them as leisure centres, even though they weren't based around a leisure pool. Well, one semantic shift, actually, that I found happens from. So in the newspapers, you see this is that the 1960s, the term leisure centre was sometimes used to mean basically an amusement arcade. So. What you get at the same time as firms like um, the Rank organisation who are moving. So the British film industry is declining and they're starting to go into things like bingo and into amusement arcades instead. And what some of these companies are doing is they're repurposing cinemas and things like this as amusement arcades. And sometimes the term leisure centre is applied to that as well. You find that in the newspapers. So it's quite interesting that the term for, for you know, somewhere that and there were moral panics about that, you know, even at that time, kind of, oh, schoolgirls are gambling in leisure centres and this kind of thing. It's quite interesting that that problematic term by the 70s was comfortably reused, if you like. Certainly, 70s, 80s, it was taken for granted that a leisure centre was a place with a pool and or with kind of sports facilities and this kind of thing. And, and part of this process, I think it, it it's very much a kind of mid-century mid 20th century progressivist project in some ways so what you get at the same time is this emergence of a profession around it and this is kind of underplayed actually in the historical literature at the moment but um what you get is um this has kind of been traced in some ways to so the university of birmingham is the first to take sport seriously in the uk and it has a department of physical education um, and, and this is about the kind of ethics of doing leisure and the idea that it makes you a, a better person to have leisure and it helps you to reach your potential and all of these kinds of ideas. So it's a very kind of mid 20th century kind of moralist, ethical idea, similar to the kind of ideas that you see in management, a few people like Peter Drucker, actually, it's very kind of, and these kinds of thinkers, it's, it's very kind of in that sort of mould. And it's a very holistic view. So a guy called George Torkildson uh, was seen as a particular pioneer of this at the Harlow Sports Centre, which is one of the very earliest. And he helps to disseminate these ideas basically by people that go and work for him, then become managers at other centres as they get set up around the country. So it's very much a dissemination practice. And what a lot of these people are doing is kind of soft work in the community as well. So it's not that they're just running a building. But there's things like hiring instructors, there's things like working out schemes of charges, running buildings, but also things like encouraging people to form sports clubs. So local, to, so forming football clubs, forming netball clubs. One of the Welsh league teams for a long time, Athen Lido, actually came out of the Athen Lido Leisure Centre. That's an extreme example, maybe. But there are many examples of these kinds of, and, and the idea of this was, is this was trying to engage different types of community and local community and to come and use the building and see it as a hub and all these kinds of things so it's not just about you know doing sport as such but it has a much broader kind of social mission and and this is then encapsulated in the formation of professional organizations as well which continue to exist exist now and of course one of the more famous sitcoms eventually was about a leisure center manager as well so for those of you from the U, not from the uk this is gordon britas who was very much the kind of stereotype of a kind of you know leisure center manager who thought genuinely thinks he's kind of improving the world by encouraging people to take part in five-a-side tournaments and things like this so so it's very much this kind of idea so by the time that the 90s come around this idea has become kind of something that you can even make comedy about if you like it's become something that can be parodied and that's quite interesting it seems to be based. It seems to be based on some of the. If you look at the shirt of, yes, you look at the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it does. There does seem to be a likeness in the shirt, and maybe the maybe something in the eyebrows of the smile there as well. I don't know. If it, we couldn't say for sure if it was modelled on uh, on Torkildson, but I'm sure that he uh, 
that that was <laughs> that was intended. Well, having looked at Todd Kildson's book, I can see that there's some kind of there's definitely some similarity, which starts with, you know, he uh, Todd Kildson's book starts with the kind of uh, ancient Greeks as a, <laughs> yeah. and builds this grand narrative of leisure. It's quite interesting. So yeah, so so what happens in an empirical sense really is that these things start to happen, and kind of the the Labour government after 1964 really promotes a kind of a, a culture, an idea of sport for all, which gets disseminated, particularly um, through Labour councils, but but also through kind of local government in particular. So, um, so this was based on the, the recommendations of the Wolfenden Committee, which really get implemented after Labour kind of come into power, if you like. That's not to say that the Conservatives before them didn't try to do things like this, but the Sports Council gave much more of an institutional structure um, and so um, around the time that England host the World Cup and win the World Cup and so on this kind of dissemination really starts to starts to kind of kick off if you like um, and, and this is a period when kind of awareness of deprivation in urban and inner city areas and so on is starting to starting to grow so what we then see is yeah what Samurai Smith calls it you know it's he sees it as kind of being about the expansion of the social democratic state. And this is the kind of post-1945 kind of settlement in Britain in which the idea was is that you had a kind of a triangle, if you like, between the kind of trade unions, government and business, um, which is running the country, essentially, a kind of consensus that there would be, um, as long as kind of uh, competition and um, yeah, kind of business-based state were allowed, there would also be a kind of social democratic state, a kind of mixed economy. Um, so yeah, so what you get is continuing spending on this. So by 1973, there were about 170 centres. The numbers vary differently when you look in different sources, of course, and that's that semantic thing about what is a sports centre, what is a leisure centre. But certainly the numbers keep expanding and the local government reorganisation in 1974 when basically many local authorities get pushed together into bigger super local authorities, provides a new impetus. So you get larger local authorities, you get formation of new metropolitan counties for a while, and this forms larger local authorities kind of with more resources. At the same time, this is when you start to get professional football clubs um, getting involved in it as well to some extent. So they're getting interested in building and operating indoor training and leisure centres for their own kind of purposes. And also the they have the possibility of applying to the Sports Council for this money to fund um, sports halls, which you know, they can use for their own training. But of course, as we know, footballers train for about two hours a day in the morning. So the rest of the time that can be hired out to the community. The argument goes. So we start to see football clubs, for example, getting into this area. Um, and, and, and it's also, yeah, this can be allowed to or used to reach communities, reach out to communities, make reuse of resources in different ways, use the facilities a little bit more. But certainly at the same time, the local government side is continuing to get and expand. But of course, at the same time, the 70s are quite important because it's a period when Gradually speaking, um, or the kind of faith in that sort of social democratic consensus starts to kind of ebb away at the very time that it's essentially at its height. So that kind of worry about British competitiveness and so on um, is really kind of ebbing away at the same time. Um, and, and after 1979, when Mrs. Thatcher comes to power, things change somewhat. So that's not to say that provision didn't keep expanding, it did. But this is where things like joint ventures with football clubs get more important, essentially, even if the kind of funding potential was going down. So the Sports Council is given less money, essentially, by this period and forces authorities, forces football clubs, forces kind of private bodies to share grants to a larger extent. But at the same time, interest in and disposable income for leisure is growing. So you've got the growth of sort of awareness and health and fitness for its own sake, maybe without actually participating in a sport, for example, this is starting to grow. 
um, at the same time. So the Jim Funder being a good example of this kind of trend and these kind of ideas starting to grow at the same time. So the expectations of provision keeps growing and local authorities are starting and they keep building leisure centres, sometimes on a much grander scale. I mean, I came across um, the building of what's called the Doom in Doncaster. Um, a report on that in The Guardian where they say, you know, it's costing them 20 million pounds and funding will come from the sale of local government land and they're hoping to get some EEC money. So the EEC is on the kind of scene by this time as well. But no central government money was going to, as the local authorities were having to raise money themselves or enter into joint partnerships to do it. And this gradually means that you get what's called the new public management becoming important here, in which local, in which um, public bodies are encouraged to become more market-like. And you start to get that kind of model that's quite current now after the kind of big society in 2010. I'm jumping forward a bit here, but around 2010, 2011, when David Cameron's pushing the big society, this is when you get that sudden jump towards, okay, we outsource things to trusts. Uh, but this is the start of that movement um, in terms of local authority gyms and so on being outsourced to, to trusts. But at the same time, yeah, you get a broad interest in recreational fitness. And this is why the private sector from the 80s and 90s starts to get involved as well. Um, and yeah, so then you start to get private gyms. OK, back to you, Alex. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin, for all, all of that. Um, so the, the the discussion and conclusions pulling that together, um, sport and leisure provision broadly evolved from the provision of uh, multi-sport arenas to a, a broad concern with fitness and recreation. Um, and the local authorities came to be expected to provide facilities despite having no statutory duty to do so. But it was it was just push, this was the thing to do. And oh, now we've got the model up and running, you're gonna fund it um, or find ways to run it and things. The role of and relationship with elite sport does require further research. We've, you know, we've identified, we know it happened, there's, look, there's factual stuff out there and we've got we've started to come across some archival information about that. And we think that's a good gap for us to pursue. Um, for bringing it to like management, um, Kevin mentioned Drucker and his idea of the rise of the manager. And I think, you know, interestingly, late 70s and 80s, Drucker stuff was um distributed as well or his ideas were distributed through pamphlets through um if, if not pub, you know some of the public sector and also some of the sort of british champion industries like the icis and things which were in a way funding some of these facilities as well so we do see the rise of the manager and the rise of the leisure center manager and that become uh, as kevin pointed out something of a profession with its own accreditations and training and sort of broad skill set it went from being we need someone who's a PE teacher. Now you can run this sports center to someone who has a, a knowledge of business, but of leisure as well and can blend the two things and then can manage and oversee the fitness and training experts or even outsource some of that and have a space like almost like a barbershop model where here's the rooms. We hire them out and personal trainers, gym people, Pilates instructors can hire the rooms to do it in more recently. Um, the Northeast, particularly Teesside, was a center of innovation um, in chemicals and so on. But also, I think uh, that some of the best examples are in these uh, these areas, such as not just but such as the Northeast, declining industrial areas um, where they had a thing that the business was still big enough that it, they could, you know, tap it up to finance some of this stuff. But at the same time, increasingly, well, there's less work, you know, Let's work for people. What do we do? How do we tackle inner city issues and stuff? I know one of the when we've looked at the Middlesbrough case, one of their arguments for getting funding for the sports centre was the diktat that you had to have sports and leisure facilities per so many head of population in a so many mile radius, which they didn't have in the inner city area. It was out in a, a, the next county. So the one argument they were making was we need to provide this if the local authority will go in half with us on it, we can get the project finished and do it. The, the local, as a local government, you'll tick that box and we'll help you do it, but we need your input to help us do that. Um, so it's a classic case of, se of semi-autonomous public service evolving out of an institutional context. It's been created by a central government, but is not administered by it. So it's this quasi-business form 
And um, sometimes it's top down and it's like, yeah, we're coming at you as sports clubs or entrepreneurs to help us with this. But the case we've got, the Middlesbrough case, is kind of the way they tried to do it with some central government funding, then somewhat privately. But they ended up going to their local authority when they found they were having problems financing the thing and, and, and running it and so on so that they could they could get that help. They were going to the local authority because they thought that, that by that point, this is pretty set in stone that it's something local authorities should should do and help with. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, I guess we're wondering, are there similar examples internationally? Uh, <clears throat> article in the, the Guardian in 1968 cites someone building national playing fields, um, uh, someone from the National Playing Fields Association claiming Britain was lagging behind other European countries. And they say by as many as 20 years, but we don't know how accurate that claim is. For sure, that you know, the National Playing Fields Association will have their own view on this and won't <laughs> have say certain things because they want to, you know, get the, the, the impetus and the money to, to do more. Um, but the, we, we suspect even, even with a grain of salt, this must be something in that. Is there any scope to extend um, this study with, with more quantitative analysis? And we've already had someone email us preempting this somewhat saying, yeah, we've done a paper on the impact on, you know, local in, in employment um, in, a, in Germany around leisure centres. Um, we focused on business and management history and to some extent public management literature, but what have we neglected here? Um, what other stuff could we be building into the, the story, the narrative we're telling to give a, um, you know, a more comprehensive background to this and, and more rigorously backed statements of fact, you know? Um, and is anyone keen even to help us above what we're doing here? Um, maybe to do something else, you know, beyond um, the current commission book chapter that takes this idea of looking at the rise of, of leisure centres and, and, and this um, with some of the kind of study who maybe has methodological skill sets complementary to our own. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks, Alex. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, it's one of those things where the older, the older you get, the more you realise things weren't always how they were when you grew up. You know, it's kind of quite nice to think about the idea that, you know, if you were suddenly transplanted from sitting here in 2020 back to 1980 or 1960 or 1930 or something, things wouldn't be, you know, there'd be lots of things that were really quite different to, uh, you know, how we grew up or how we operate with them now. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Jorge uh, Tova has got his hand up with a question. Hi. Hello. Uh, this was a great talk, especially because I lived in Oxford in the late 70s when my father was doing his PhD, and it remembered me a lot of my life there as a kid. Great. Um, and my question follows the, the, a bit the story of my life, because I, in Oxford, I used to go to a swimming pool. I had a chess club and, of course, football. <laughs> uh, and then I, I went to Spain in the 1980s, and they had what they call every town, which is the same thing. It's but mostly that they devoted to the sports only. And now I'm back here in Colombia, where I'm from in South America, and uh, we are more than 20 years lagging behind everyone else. And we have these interesting discussions in terms of sports policy and, and sports as public policy. And kind of discussing, OK, we should work on this type of, you can call it either uh, sports areas like in Spain, Polyportivo, so you can call it uh, leisure, uh, le le leisure, I forget, the leisure areas like you have in, in the UK. But I guess one question we are uh, discussing here is, OK, you know, a priori, there is this discussion that it is, of course, a good investment to have uh, kids and people and communities move into these spaces and create community and devote time in a worthwhile way. But I was wondering if you have uh, researched or investigated a bit on the actual social consequences for the community, maybe for the local communities. Uh, was there less crime? Were there more more girls going to, at the time, you know, going to a university was, the, what kind of effects do you think this type of uh, areas had on, on, at the local level? 
I think that's a really good question. And um, we've not found, you know, the, the, the simple answer is we've not found a great deal um, of stuff to prove anything, you know, I, either way. I'm, now, there must be some, well, I say there must be. In this day and age, there'd be evaluating things left, right and centre, especially <laughs> if it had European funding and this kind of thing. Back then, I don't know to what extent these things were were measured tangibly, or they did, um, or they kept, you know, did formal surveys or, or even more, you know, wider studies, looking, you know, drawing data from other places to try and build a picture of this. I don't know to what extent data was available or they sorted out. Now, I think it's a really good question. I think one thing we'll have to do is try and look. At, you know, if we can find some of these locations like I've identified where the leisure centre was seen as a great thing, mu municipal thing and, and so on, to see what was done actually by maybe by the local authorities there in terms of evaluation, because I've not come across anything yet that gave any actual hard facts on this. Now, there was things in like the local government chronicle we've seen, which tried to encourage local authorities to save their football clubs in the grounds because of their community value more broadly. And they talk about, well, you know, and we've spoken to local government officers from the time who say, well, yeah, it's somewhere like Middlesbrough. Why else would anyone from Manchester go there on a Saturday afternoon or think of it, you know, you'd be to see football. Over. So there was some maybe some soft power and maybe some mild economic effect. I live in York now. And they, they've moved to a new out of town stadium, but it used to be you could hear the fans come off the train sometimes and walk through and they would do a bit of a morning through town in the pubs and things. So obviously a few hundred people coming in and bringing some trade um, on a route to the stadium. Um, in terms of the leisure centres, I mean, yeah, the benefits are more. It's not just about do people come and spend money in the local pubs and stuff. It is what are the longer term outcomes for the people? And I don't know. We could look at maybe figures on um yeah like sport take up we could look at and and i think it comes to there's another point here as well in terms of there was a the policy for a long time was sport for all and that's what a lot of these things were for but that didn't lead to um world leadership in sport for good <laughs> britain and some people have said maybe perhaps the opposite that it didn't help elite sport and then we didn't have the figureheads and the inspirational people or the dream that you could achieve it. And then it, it kind of declined a bit and people lost interest in sport and fitness somewhat. I don't know if it's true, but it's kind of a theory I've seen written. But then with John Major and the National Lottery in the mid 90s, the one of the ideas was to pump a lot of the National Lottery money raised through the National Lottery into sport funding and whilst there's a sport for all element to also use that to push elite sport as well to get these great achievers and you know people and when one and almost have competition so where sports doing well it will get more funding and when it doesn't do well it'll lose its funding as we've seen with and as we've seen in the last olympics the um was it bmxing and the skateboarding they made a case where they'd had to crowdfund their crowdsource their funding and did better than some some that had done well uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, a young lady did, you know, took up BMXing and did it without all the lottery funding and achieved really well. So it opens up. There's all kinds of spin-off discussions to be had. Um, it's keeping it tight, really. I think I'm not sure what we'd need. We might need to look at. Um, I think the starting point would be to look at what the lo were the local authorities actually evaluating this and were they doing it very in an objective way. And I think there's some commentary to be had on that. Actually, it's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, I suppose there's two things you could do, but it's a diff the different papers, but I think for this one, it would be good to look at if the local authorities closed the loop, if you like, and evaluated it after the fact. Yeah. I guess you could do a sort of Barden Matheson type study on overall local crime rates and life expectancy and things like this, but that's a different paper, I think. The, the, the stuff we've seen of the, the Middlesbrough case when they're trying to get the sports all together, they were they did have a load of letters of interest from community groups to say, and they were almost, they didn't, I've not seen them quantify it with, we have this many disabled people and anything like that, anything quite as uh, uh, exact or, or crude as that. But um, they do say, look, here's the examples of all the community people who would use this facility if you would give us some money to open it. They've said they're going to come. 
And there were there was like, you know, older age groups, female, male, disabled, many types of communities. So they were trying to make a case that, you know, yeah, we haven't got an, we haven't got a bar chart or an exact figure to show this, but here's a flavor of the types of groups who've shown a they've put in writing and an expression of interest in using the facility. So they're definitely interested in this stuff and, and in kind of documenting it. But I think when they were for the purpose of pursuing money as much as anything. You know, so if oh, we need some funding to get this done, let's show what good we're doing, you know, and I don't know if they followed it up and said, and this is what we then achieved. Here's the information for the record's sake, you know, but they definitely made a song and dance about it when they were trying to tap up for money that it had potential to do this. I think it's interesting you mentioned um, you. The, you know, the maths and kind of approaches, Ken, because it kind of almost strikes me that this is a little bit like, mm -hmm. you know, hosting a mini sporting event by having a you know a sports center in in your town so you can have a lot of those similar kinds of uh, dynamics aren't you that those that want it are gonna say you know here's all the benefits of it we need all this extra money for it um, and obviously likely uh, inflate <laughs> the likely positive impact in order to make sure that it happens um the thing that struck me uh, just thinking about the way you, when, when you're talking about that is um, there must be archival materials in local uh, archival offices and things like that because they're often run by local councils, right? So presumably, you know, because I mean, when, when you try and look at old football club information, you find that because the club was you know, went bankrupt and was taken over by someone else, you know, they torched all the old books and things. But presumably, that's not the case for you know larger centres and councils and things. Well, yeah, I mean, there's stuff between the football club and the council. A lot of it various subcommittees and it's just not even through the archives not traceable i mean we've had some look through private individuals who were working at the council at that time just talking to them about it or seeing the odd thing but we've had a, a colleague we used to write with he went to the the teesside archives to find evidence of stuff about the sports hall and the council and local authority involvement and there's just nothing kept you mm -hmm. know so i don't know but yeah. it's it's a really good idea i think you know a starting point might be to identify some of these hotbed places and then just tap up the local archive and just see what we can see about it. Remember Kevin who went to Newcastle and they had all that stuff about, oh, yeah. the, you know, the, the carry on when they were Newcastle United and falling out about the World Cup hosting in the stadium and the great, the grand plans for making, a, you know, putting motorways through the city and things, some of which happened, some of which didn't. But Pete Dan Smith wanted to make uh, St. James's Park into a multi-sport arena multi-sport arena and there is some stuff on in Newcastle but again it's just plans and and things and I yeah I don't know I think it's a good point we, we must have we should I think they, try to find some of these things and think about what our, our measures might be we need to look at what they wanted to claim was going to happen and then see what figures were kept for that and I think I think that's you know you, you're pushing us into realizing we have to do this I think <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, I agree. I think the thing is, is like, it's getting a good, so one of the things you find with local authority archives, I mean, I've worked on, worked with them in various ways. And yeah, they, some local authorities have really good archives and some not as much. <laughs> Sometimes stuff in a lot of detail survives. And yeah, <laughs> sort of this thing. But yeah, we will do that, yeah, to see it more, because I think it's definitely a... I, mean, yeah, yeah. Else, I guess I mean I hadn't appreciated the extent to which football clubs were involved with these kinds of things. Um, presumably, if you're able to match football clubs with leisure centre initiatives, mm. you would be able to at least look at, you know, because the thing that I quite always enjoy about sport economics is that you can always use the regular data that you get from every week's match results. <laughs> you, know, you mentioned Aston Villa, well, they went into quite a bit of a nosedive at you know, various points, haven't they? You know. And down to the third division at times and stuff like that uh, you know, and therefore you, you've got other clubs as well and so you know can you can you see any kind of pattern in terms of the the fluctuations if clubs are diversifying away from their core purpose of you know yeah. winning games on the field or does it show in terms of do they win fewer games on the field that kind of thing yeah it's interesting isn't it i mean uh, definitely we could we could if we could get hold again i think this stuff's more readily available now about the the financial accounts of the clubs but they're not always as easy to get from back then but if we could see that i mean you could look at villa or someone and say well even if you can't prove a causal link between what they're doing and how they're performing you could at least look at the club's finances and see what percentage of their 
money, you know, how, how do we think they use, are they, are they running this at a profit or a loss? And therefore, is it a distraction or is it contributing in some way? And how, you know, how is that affecting their cash flow and these kind of things? And just see the, how the clubs run would be really useful, actually, as well. You can go about quite some way with Company's House online. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it's all online now. Yeah. Not all, but, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Online. You get a bit of that, but yeah, it's, yeah. We got some good stuff on, uh, when we were researching Middlesbrough, we found, because we, you know, they would, this basically folded the club and bought an off the shelf company and then attached yeah. themselves to that. We, we found the original company, it's called Black Play Limited, and we found all the, uh, well, I don't know what it was, it was just a random business that they just picked up, like a defunct one, the shell, and they just bought it. And but yeah, we found that, and we found that they'd, um, there was an idea for it. They wanted to call themselves Sporting Club Middlesbrough. Um, and they had this grand sort of like European uh, approach to have a, yeah, where, and it was said where football will be just one weekly activity. We wanted to do all kinds of things around that and be a, a sporting club for the town with football as one activity. And the sports centre was going to be part of that ambition by, by, by some point, you know, it's how they thought they could make it profitable. <laughs> Fascinating. Anyone else, any questions and comments they want to make? I think one of the things that's quite interesting, I guess, is that international perspective that you mentioned and whether 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 we were, you know, the UK was that far behind because presumably there wasn't the same level of travel so it wasn't that you could travel somewhere else and spot just how far behind we were and so you could make the case we're so far behind we've got to do something and and no it, 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 it always seems to be if someone's far behind no one ever says we're three years behind they always say we're 50 years behind or we're 20 years behind so i don't know to what extent it's a turn of phrase it's a bit like saying oh it was the size of 10 double decker buses or three forests the size of Wales or something it's just a standard uh, truism, but I don't, <laughs> I don't know how accurate yeah. it is. Some people make a point with it, don't they? It's a turn of phrase. It's a British psychosis as well, um, in some ways that, oh, we're falling behind, so therefore we must make big investments in this thing to catch up. So, um, I, yeah, so I think that's the, um, that's the thing. And so there is that kind of sense, yeah, that these kinds of facilities already exist on the continent. Oh. How far but that's <laughs> that's one of these great nebulous British terms. So how far that's true is also <laughs> an important point. Is that when these things were run, um, it seems to be that they were they would charge people eighty p to get in, but it cost them one eight one pound eighty per person really to to fund it. So they were running them at a loss, but they can only raise so much money off, you know, rates and things. Whereas on the continent, maybe there's more of an appetite in some countries to pay more of your income and income tax. So there's maybe a bit more money available to spend. Therefore, people might expect a bit more back in terms of these things and the money's available to do it. Whereas in the UK, it's this hybrid. We're not quite we don't like as realistic as America, but we're, we're not quite willing to give up 50% of our income <laughs> either. Yeah. So we're, we're kind of a halfway house, really. And I think, you know, I think we, we want quite a bit for not a lot. And it's never enough and it's never not in you know it's never little enough to pay out and it's never quite enough to receive and that seems to be the the british equilibrium <laughs> yeah, there, there tends to be a kind of discomfort as well with the state doing kind of there's a, a yeah with the state either being too altruistic but then if the state becomes too business-like at the same time you get this oh no but now it's competing with private industry kind of <laughs> well that's an important... in a difficult position in brain because it, of that the email we got about uh, the gender issue, were these things advertised to, to yeah. females as much as males? Well, the thing was, they weren't really, t it was just done. It, you know, people didn't think about that at the time as much. They do now, but they're more conscious about it all. But at the time, they weren't, the leisure centres weren't trying to persecute women in any way, but there was just a natural order to things that they, they went along with. But in America, they did open up with that law uh, for, for equal provision in schools and things. Now, part of me thinks that's, yeah, people who are campaigning for equality want that as an equality issue. But another, for me, it fits with the American 
approach as I've seen it, which is more like, well, if you say that you're not giving equal soccer availability to females, you're shutting out half the demographic for people who provide the soccer product. So you're shutting down the market. So I think in England, it took a little longer to come around. You know, the FA had rules preventing women from playing football, you know, yeah. whereas I think now it's like the, the pressures have come, you know, FIFA have seen it as a, like, oh, there's a growth market there. We can double our market share in theory by unlocking the other half of the population, <laughs> you know? So I think in Britain as well, it's become the whole leisure provision thing became more market minded as well. And uh, especially once sort of Margaret Thatcher cut the funding a bit and was relying more on private funding, then they were like, well, okay, I'm an entrepreneur wanting to fund, finance a, or I'm a local government expected to run it as a profit center, not as a loss maker. I can't do it if I could, if I've only got like 80 people a week wanting to play football, but if I could have 120 people a week wanting to play football, 160, then it could be profitable. Where do those people come from? Well, at the minute, mm -hmm. women are playing it. So the obvious idea is just open the market up to women and that increases it's a bigger uh, number of customers and the more money you made. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's, a, there's a business argument for all these things as well, as well as a sort of social justice angle to it. And so nothing's as simple as one thing or the other, really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the other thing is that what's often neglected in is kind of, so what was often forgotten in kind of historical views of sport as well is that in public policy sense, it grew out of education in Britain to some extent as well. So it was a, so one of the ways that you see that is when they set up the first sports centres, the instructors and managers are employed on the further education uh, salary structure, for example, and they're employed as lecturers in or instructors in games, you know, and that idea then runs through from, you know, we had quite, you know, in, in British schools, we had segregated classes for males and females for a long time. We had until mm -hmm. the 70s, I think, in some cases, the six certainly uh, you know, boys and girls queued up at different entrances. They had different Kevin, we, we'll have been the first people in our families to not go through that sort yeah. of segregation or apartheid approach yeah. to education, you know, as we as we see it. But the people of the generation before us don't might not see it quite that way, you know. But to us, it's like, whoa, except, you know, separate gate. My kids' school, they've got a gate. It's, it's a Victorian school. They've got a gate that says girls above it and one that says boys <laughs> still. But everyone can go through them. But they were the old, the old entrances to them, yeah. <laughs> well, the kind of consequence of that was that they, so, so it's not that women weren't playing sport, but they were playing sports that were considered female sports, like netball or hockey. And so, the, so when you get to this multi-sport provision idea, what you're getting is, oh yeah, we can build an indoor sports hall and all weather pitches that can hold both netball and football, say. And so that's where that kind of angle is going. And I think that's, that's often the sort of I think that's often the sort of forgotten element in it in a sense yeah. is that it's kind of the impact of it's not to say it's correct but the impact of the FA's discrimination may have been that women were pushed towards other sports it's not that they weren't um, participating as such a, mysteriously there's never been much of a push for men's netball <laughs> yeah. but but there we go but yeah so that but that that's the kind of dynamic that we're playing with in the 60s and 70s. And then it starts to kind of move very much the other way as a sporting, yeah, the, the global body start to say, oh yeah, but there are untapped markets here. We can. I think that's the thing with the netball thing. If it became globally big business, I'm sure Adidas or Nike would be saying, hang on, this isn't equality enough. We need men's netball. You know, there would be, the financial case would be <laughs> it's very obvious. It wouldn't be couched as we need to open up the market, but it would be like there's massive potential here. How do we address this that makes it look like we're doing it for some good cause, you know? And they would be really pushing for it, you know? <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be interesting. <laughs> so, what do, you think, I mean, what do you think about that? Obviously, you know, the, the more private dynamic has been ongoing now since really the early 80s, you know, and to the extent that now you have you know, private gyms up and down the high street and mm -hmm. You know, for profit football, five aside centres as well. Yeah. And do you, how do you see that kind of ever increasing private sector involvement, um, you know, working itself out in terms of sporting, I mean, provision, but also sporting participation? I think at, at the minute, um, 
there's there's a blend in York, which I'm not in any way taking as a, a microcosm of the whole world at all. But as one lo like local example, we, we have a blend here. And what's the, the football club have built a new community stadium with facilities and its own five aside courts that the community can use. But also um, the some of the traditional, uh, I think, publicly owned or quasi public leisure centers are there. In, in the 90s, I think they were taken out of full local government ownership and they were set up as little you know, quasi autonomous social enterprise or community interest company type things. And it's certainly one of those that I go to regularly as well out here. The, the university had a sports centre that had five-a-side courts, basketball, yeah. all that. Now there's a York Sports Village, which is the same thing, but with a fancier swimming pool and <laughs> a fancier name called the, the village as to differentiate from the centre. And there's, just, there's, a di there's lots of different providers. York St. John University have a load of stuff as well and the college that they're part of a group with do. There's all kinds of stuff. And it you can drive past it in the day and there might not be anyone on it, but on an evening, they're all full. And there's the, the football club are doing, they've got money. One of the things I've participated in, I, I was ill a few years ago and I'm, it's a long recovery, but I'm doing like walking football. And some in some places, it's only over 50s. And I think generally, typically men who play it, but in the... Um, in York, it's quite an open session. So um, I'm, you know, I'm 43, but I'm attending and playing. And there's some people younger than me. There's even there's a few females. There's younger. There's females who are younger than me. Females are older than me. It's a real mixed crowd. There's people with sort of quite uh, debilitating sort of disability, worse than my, mine have been. Um, you know, I've got I've got some coordination balance problems sometimes and fatigue and things. But there's people who, you know, noticeably slow movers and things. But everyone's welcome and does it. And these are held on it. They're organised by the football club. They get money off the North Riding Football Association, North Riding of Yorkshire, who I think get it off the FA. And it's funded partly by Mars, uh, the the conf <laughs> Mars bars. <laughs> it's a good health snack. Um, <laughs> and they, they, but they use some of these sort of, for want of a better word, quango pitches. Foot their own football club pitches, the York uh, University pitches sometimes, I think. Sometimes, they, and then they do things for little kids as well, um, holiday football sessions on the park near here mm. and things. So they do, there's all, I don't know, there's all kinds of things. And they're all, you could see it as like, well, they're competing and the, the public will get the most efficient thing because with all these different people providing it, the best will prevail that's one view of it. The other view is, well, to some extent, they're working together because none of them can do it on their own. So they're all tending to focus on what they're good at. So if the university can put on courts because they can teach it and use it for teaching and education, but then they need to raise some money outside of that. Well, there's other people who know what they're doing with older people or younger people, but they need a facility, but they don't want to pay for a facility just to use it once a week. So it, I don't know, it does kind of work out efficiently, but whether it'll shake down further, mm. you know, I think a lot of it, as much as they like to say, oh, it's driven by private ideas and football clubs. I think at the end of the day, when it comes to sport and fitness, a lot of it depends on government policy and what funding's available for what. Mm. That mm. seems to affect availability in a big way, really, you know. And it's just pots of money moved around and how do you apply for them and to what extent do people, you know, to do walking football or pay three quid a session, you know, but it probably costs more than that to put on, you know, and, and, and things. Yeah, yeah. Um, that makes me think actually because I live on a new build development here at Didcot and what they, I mean, it still surprises me now because they gave over a massive area in the middle of the development you know, it's 6,000 houses, but then halfway up, there's a massive um, area which is all cricket pitches, football mm -hmm. pitches, rugby, tennis, etc. They call it Boundary Park as well, which is an old and fun <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, But it's, you know, and, and as I understand, you know, I mean, basically the way it's organised, there's a pavilion in the middle, but it's a joint thing between um, three, you know, a cricket club, a football club and a rugby club. Yeah. And there's There must be some additional... Funding. Yeah, so when the housing estates go up, they have to pay a proportion in, do they, for local infrastructure and things. And at the time they're doing it, sometimes it's negotiated that there'll be a, a, a village green or a sports facility built with some of that money. And then sometimes it's decided after the fact. But I think 
I get the sense increasingly they're trying to build that in and, and also to get the developments through. They're saying, well, with the money that we have to make available, we could also include this in the development and yeah, things. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. There's more of that. And it's these, I think the, one of the things has been the innovation of what they're calling the 3G and 4G pitches, the all, you know, all weather surfaces, because where my parents live, there was playing fields, but they'd get very muddy um, yeah, yeah. and things. Whereas now they're on about building, building over some of the, the local authority have sold off agricultural land for housing. But what mm -hmm. they're saying is, oh, well, what we're going to do, we're going to put all weather pitches on there. Now, the grass pitches would just run and there was money available and a groundsman was paid and you could just access them freely. I used to go jogging. Yeah. There was local sports teams that pay where a couple of quid subs and, uh, you know, play in the local leagues and Sunday leagues and things. But it was boggy. It was what it was. Um, like now they're on about putting these all weather courts. You'll have to probably presumably have to book them and pay for them more formalized. And it's keeping the public off public land. It's been hived off for private things. But at the same time, if you can book it and you're prepared to pay a little bit, you can use it more in a way because it's not going to be like complete mud bath for half oh, round. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, swings and roundabouts, really. I, I don't know. How, I don't know how I feel about it. I like the traditional grass. It's good for nature. It's good for public access and all this. But I think some of these all weather surfaces um, and the way they are now is, is pretty good and pretty exciting, especially for kids to learn to play because um, they can do it more year round and you can work on skill a little bit more maybe as well and you know who who can hoof it through the mud the most you know <laughs> yeah an interesting thing was uh, i seem to remember the english fa were very resistant to pyramid clubs getting 3g pitches for a while even though it would reduce the number of matches cancelled yeah on saturdays which was... well it still is right because teams that come into the football league still have to they put their field, so Sutton United have had to this season, Harrogate Town had to last season. So there's still some, you know, obviously lower down the, the pyramid, it's it's now more acceptable, but the Football League certainly yeah. seems to still put in place restrictions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions from folk? Well, in which case, I am going to wrap up uh, and um, we, we can carry on chatting, certainly. But what I'll do is I'll wrap up the uh, the formal event uh, and uh, just simply say as we close, thank you very much to Alex and Kevin for a really interesting, uh, thought-provoking uh, talk. And obviously, there's lots of interesting research uh, ahead of you uh, on that. Um, we're, as I mentioned earlier on, we're going to take uh, a break next week. It's the um, it's the late bank, summer bank holiday here in the UK. Uh, and we'll then return on September the 3rd when Benedict Schmoll uh, of the University of Düsseldorf is going to be presenting the long shadow of an infection, COVID-19 and labour productivity. Um, so please do join us in two weeks' time. Uh, and in the meantime, have a great weekend uh, and a great uh, bank holiday if you uh, haven't been in a place where there's a bank holiday the week after next. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for your question. And uh, and yeah, thanks everyone for, for paying attention and, and coming to talk. It's been great. <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone. Taking